Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Marlene, and the team for inviting me here today. I see it as a real honour, um, and I'm really excited about being here and listening to everybody else's presentation. It is a bit daunting being filmed, though, because my Liverpoolian accent will come out <laughs> in the filming. Um, I'm going to talk to you about qualitative research and how it can inform quantitative research. And I thought that the best way to illustrate this is by actually giving you one of the examples from the field, one of my very recent research projects. Before I do so, I just want to talk about some of the ways that qualitative work can inform randomised controlled trials. Because suppose I, traddle, I straddle two different types of methodologies. I do randomised controlled trials and I also do qualitative work. So before a trial, we can use qualitative methods to explore issues related to healthcare questions. We can generate hypotheses for further examination. We can define and develop our interventions and develop or select appropriate outcomes. And with the example that I'm going to show you, you will see evidence of that um, throughout my presentation. I'm not going to present um, any examples of this, but I thought it was um, worth actually mentioning just so that we have the complete picture. So during a trial, we can examine whether the intervention was delivered as intended, including describing the intervention. It can help us unpack processes of implementation and change and explore the views of those who are either participants um, or researchers um, associated with the intervention. And after trial, after trial, um, we can use qualitative work, and I have done in many of my studies, to explore the reasons for the findings of a trial. For example, in one of my studies, looking at the use of the partogram, uh, which measures the progress of um, labour, a lot of the women stated that they were more satisfied if they had the most intervention. And as midwives, we would find that quite surprising. But the qualitative work actually highlighted the fact that those who did have the most intervention also had the most midwifery contact and also had the most support. So sometimes it does actually help us to understand the findings in ways that quantitative research can't um, do it. It helped to explain variations in effectiveness within a sample, examines the appropriateness of underlying theory, and also, as we all know, generates further questions or hypotheses. The other very important thing within research at the moment, and this is a very, a very buzz thing, um, and there's a lot written on it um, within the last 12 months or so, is the need to conduct more and more translational research. In its simplest form, this means moving from the bench to the bedside. Um, and I think that, you know, as applied um, researchers, which many midwives are, it is actually really important to understand the bench side as well. And more and more studies will be produced and more and more grants will be available for this kind of research. The example I'm going to present to you today is about baby skin care. Why would we even look at this um, as midwives? Well, I think that anybody who works with children or anybody who has got children will be well aware of the rising prevalence of atopic eczema. You can see here how startling this graph is from the 1940s um, to the 2000s, how much the percentage of children with atopic eczema has actually risen. Back to your physiology. Um, the midwives amongst us might have to dig a bit deep for this, um, as I did when I started this study. But this is actually a cross-sectional um, diagram of the skin barrier, or the stratum corneum. But it's quite, it's quite good to look at it um, as a brick wall. Um, this is a really good analogy that often the, some of the dermatologists um, that I work with use when they're explaining the skin to, to children. The brick um, is analogous to the skin cell, and you can see here. But when you have lots of bricks, um, as you do with lots of skin cells, you need something to keep that structure together. So in a brick wall, you will have the iron rods, which you can see here, which are the same as what's called cornea desmosomes in the skin. So they actually strengthen the layers of the skin. 
and in a brick um, you have the brick surrounded by mortar and the mortar protects the brick and helps to to bring the bricks together and in the skin you have what's called lipid lamellae which does exactly the same job so if we look at the normal skin barrier you can see that you do get the natural shedding of skin um, in the top layers and th this is quite normal if you get um, skin um, with atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema, you can see that the cornea desmosomes are broken down further. And this is because of the increased production of proteases. If you add harsh soap and detergents to the skin, well, then they break down even further, as you can see here. And this allows the penetration of allergens and irritants into the skin and this can cause a flare of atopic eczema. But there are some good things that we can do for the skin and there are some very bad things that we can do for the skin. And the baddies you can see here, things like harsh soap, harsh bubble bath, liquid detergents, cleaning fluids and surfactants. But there are also some very good things you can do for the skin. And, and the best thing for skin um, to protect the skin barrier is actually the use of emollients. So based on what I've told you so far, should women bath their babies with water alone or should they use products? And I think this is a huge dilemma, not just for health professionals, but also for parents too. So if we look at the evidence, there's actually a dearth of good evidence from randomised control trials of baby's skin care. A systematic review by Lynn Walker in 2005 actually found no trials to include. Since that time, there's only been two very small trials that have been published in abstract form only. And because they've been published only in abstract form, it's been very difficult to actually assess the methodology of these trials. And despite contacting the authors, we haven't been able to get any further information. There's been huge professional deba debate regarding whether we should use products or we should use water for bathing babies. And part of this, this debate stemmed from the NICE guidelines. And the NICE, in the absence of any real empirical evidence, um, stated that perhaps water should be preferable without any evidence, but they did recommend that we do further work. And Sue MacDonald and Mary Steen also published a paper in the RCM journal saying that we really do need a randomised controlled trial. Just another thing to bear in mind as well is that there is a lot of emerging evidence that water alone can be an irritant. Tap water, for example, alters the pH of the skin, um, which is bad. Um, when skin is immersed in water for any length of time, it can act as an irritant um, and it can break down the skin. And water doesn't actually offer any barrier at all, so it doesn't have any emollient properties. And this has all led to inconsistencies in the advice given to mothers, which is why I was really interested in this subject from seeing um, in clinical practice the, the problems and the issues and the confusion. So we decided that we did actually need to conduct a randomised control trial. But we had lots of unanswered questions. Would women want to participate? Would midwives and health professionals comply? Because we know that women do listen to midwives and, and health visitors. Would the study be influenced by being industry funded? And if it isn't industry funded, who else would fund such a study when, you, when you're competing against research into cancer, etc.? What is the current practice? We know what, what seems to be advocated, which is water only, but what is actually happening there on the, on the shop floor? What outcomes are important, not just to us, but also um, to the women? What is the appropriate duration of follow-up? And what confounding variables are there? So what, what are mothers actually doing to their baby's skin? We know that, that they're using oils, they use towels, they use various products, and we need to capture that because all these things can have an impact on skin assessment. And what are the practical issues in terms of recruitment, consent, 
um, carrying out biophysical assessments of the baby's skin, um, et cetera, et cetera. And because we had all these questions, we decided that we'd embark on a qualitative study, the aim of which was to explore in depth the views of women and health professionals on the use of baby skin care products. We wanted to gain a deeper understanding of the different perspectives. We wanted to determine the acceptability of a trial and we also wanted to inform the design of an RCT. So in terms of the methodology, we used a qualitative interpretive approach. We decided to use longitudinal data collection so we could capture the views at various time points. We used face-to-face -face interviews and we used triangulation of the different sources, so the women, the midwives and the health visitors. And we carried out a thematic analysis. Sorry that this is a little bit busy, this slide, but this just gives you an overview of the times of data collection and the numbers included in our sample. You can see from the women that we recruited 15 women in the antenatal period and 15 in the postnatal period. And then we followed them up at various time points. For the midwives, we interviewed 20 midwives, 10 in the community and 10 in the hospital. And all the midwives were those that would be in contact with babies. And health visitors, we interviewed 10 health visitors. And then we brought this together um, in our thematic analysis. So just to tell you the, um, the main findings, there was, there was three main themes, the mirage of evidence, towing the party line, and influential marketing. And additionally, we asked specifically about the views of a trial. Mirage of evidence. This was really about health professionals seeing something that really just wasn't there. Midwives in particular were adamant that practice was based on sound empirical evidence. As you can see from this hospital midwife, she says there's several pieces of research. But then later on she says, don't ask me to name them. I don't know. I've got them at home in a file. I would like to see that file. <laughs> But none of the um, health professionals were able to identify any specific papers. So the community midwife said, the only evidence base I know of is that nothing is recommended. And then she talks about there are articles that I've read and seen in journals. And another midwife said, I've read something in a magazine, but nobody could actually pinpoint that evidence. Health facilities were perhaps a little bit um, more honest, and they would say, I'm actually not aware of a lot of evidence. A lot of what we do is word of mouth, um, talking to GPs, talking to other colleagues, and they often went on instinct. And the women, especially the Prime of Paris women, they were just very trusting. Um, they listened to what midwives and health visitors said about water only, and they said they've got no reason to doubt what they're telling me. But interestingly, by four weeks, all Prima Paris women were actually using products. Multi-Paris women had very different influences. They used a lot of trial and error, and they looked at their friends um, and family to actually influence them. The second um, main theme was towing the party line, and I don't think this really needs any explanation. Health professionals would say things like, we have to advocate water and only, only, that's trust policy. But interestingly, at the study hospital, um, there wasn't any policy at all. One of the health visitors said, no, nothing's written down, no policy as such. And it seemed that for the health visitors, there was this unwritten policy about what they should do. And for women, um, they, they stated that they would use cotton wool and water because they'd be shouted at um, if they didn't. So again, they were doing what they thought they should be doing. But, interestingly, um, views did seem to change during the course of the interview. Um, it seemed that at the beginning of the interview, 
all the health professionals and the women said, yes, this is what I do, I'm doing what I'm told to do. Halfway through the interview, they would all say, well, actually, she does a bit of this and she does a bit of that, and I've witnessed her doing this. But by the end of the interview, many of them actually admitted, well, actually, I do use a bit of product now and again. And I think this is a very good example of the importance of um, having a really good interviewer. Um, the, in the interview for this was actually Adiri Sakiri, who's um, a research assistant of mine, and she's got a very nice way when she interviews, and she built up a fantastic relationship with these women and the, the midwives over the time, and um, they were actually very honest by the end of the interview. It also demonstrates how that when you are doing in-depth interviews that you need to actually you know, give time for people to, for the interviewee to feel comfortable with you because you get the richer stuff as the interview goes along. So I just want to give you some examples of that. For health professionals, for the midwife, use warm water and cotton wool. That's what's advocated within the trust. But then a little bit later on she said, I probably would put a little bit in actually. I suppose really I shouldn't do if it's not the evidence, but I'm being truthful. I probably would. And the health visitor, she said, when she was in hospital having hers, it was just water and cotton wool, but she was one of those mums that thought a little bit of product wouldn't hurt. And there was this personal professional di um, conflict, really, and dichotomy um, with midwives and health visitors often wanting to use products, but actually feeling that maybe they shouldn't do and they should do what they believe to be policy. And the women, they were no different. You know, now generally as a rule, I don't put anything in the bath at all. And then a bit later on in the interview, once or twice I put a little bit of the brand name wash in the water. The third theme, influential marketing. And this was really interesting because midwives seemed to market what they thought were natural products. For example, this community midwife talked about the skin being an organ and having its own capacity to produce oils. And there isn't any need to use soaps or lotions, so they, then she went on to market natural products and waters. The community midwife, um, water is natural, water is no extra cost to the mums and it does the job well. And they were more likely to market non-baby products than they were to market baby products and in particular oils, like this health visitor who said, use traditional oils that you've had in the house anyway rather than perfume products or products you have to buy and minimum additives really. And another one talked about natural oils, baby massage, grapeseed oil, um, natural oils. And this is really interesting. Um, there is um, a lot of emerging evidence that oils can be quite harmful to the skin and it's very dependent on the amount of oleic acid that's contained in these, in these products. And one of my colleagues, Professor Mike Cork, he's done some work on adults and he's used only a teaspoon of oil on adult skin over a month period, so one teaspoon over that whole month and the skin has totally broken down on that adult. Yet midwives and health visitors traditionally have recommended the use of these oils because they think that they're doing, doing good. Now, a lot of people do advocate olive oil for things like cradle cap, and that's logical because it, it actually helps the desquamation of the skin. It actually sheds the skin, but you wouldn't really want to put it on healthy skin or cracked skin. And this midwife in the hospital, this, this one startled me really. Um, when she was saying, I might even advise something like massage oil, just sunflower oil, oil, but I wouldn't advise any brand of sunflower oil. I'd just say get the cheapest and the purest and you'll be fine. And I think that this, this is quite dangerous. So what interests me here is the fact that um, the way that health professionals use the evidence or the lack of evidence um, and to promote one thing, whereas they won't pr promote another. And it's, um, yeah, it really needs unpicking. It's quite a complex issue. In terms of marketing, women believe that um, a product that was marketed for a baby was therefore safe. Um, if it was new to the market, they might be a bit wary, um, but if it's on those supermarket shelves, well, then it must be okay. And um, they talked about this particular marketing words like hypoallergenic, 
and um, there was lots of words, natural, um, mild, all these words actually do convince um, women that products are safe. It's interesting because, again, one of, um, one of my colleagues, Professor Mike Coe, he, he tells of a, of a story where um, he went to the supermarket with his young child um, who really wanted one of those Winnie the Pooh um, bubble baths. And he knew that they had very harsh, uh, it was very harsh soap and had very high levels of surfactant in. And he really didn't want his child to have this. But his child was very small and in the tantrum stage and started creating in the supermarket shelves. So he went to the shelf and he got it and he hid it under a loaf of bread and he bought it. But then when he went back home, he thought, there's no way am I going to let my child have this product. So he stood on, um, he emptied all the product out, cleaned it thoroughly so there was no traces left and filled it with an emollient product instead. He stood on the side of the bath so he'd get bubbles and poured it from a high height and everything was fine and his child was happy. But then he thought, I can't really waste the product I've, I've poured out. So he actually used it to clean the dog. Uh, but the thing is, his dog got eczema. So, so that was just to illustrate that maybe not all the products that are on the shelves um, are things that we should be recommending. The women did doubt the cleansing ability of water. For example, and there was loads of, com loads of comments around this, I wouldn't dream of getting in the shower and not using any soap on myself, so why should it be any different for a baby? And another said, you know, you would be there for ages with water. It's just bizarre, but it can almost feel like it's not clean enough. When we asked about the need for a trial, all participants agreed that a trial was necessary. But they did say that a trial shouldn't be industry-led and that you do need to have the right team. Um, and it was interesting that, you know, that women were quite aware of you know, the need for people like dermatologists on board and they did talk about having a baby doctor on board. Um, most women stated that they would take part, but those who wouldn't were concerned about being allocated to the water only. And they did provide lots of useful information regarding the design of such a trial. The general trial views, they'd want to know who'd produce the evidence and they'd want professional input, dermatologists and proper research done. It would have to be more than just a company saying it independently. I'd want the results to be published regardless of the findings. And the women said, yes, it's information for new mums. So they welcomed that. They welcomed anything that would actually help them to make their decisions. One of the health visitors did, though, say, it doesn't quite sit easily with me, but I'm not, surely, I'm not sh entirely sure the reasons why. I think I just wonder how, whether they, meaning the companies, would be very influential if they funded it. I think they would possibly cherry pick information because they wouldn't want information that would destroy their product really. So this was relating to industry funded trials. But this view was actually in the minority. And there was more um, health professionals that would say things like this. Um, and I'll let you read this, but basically what this midwife is saying is that if an industry funded a trial, and if it was published regardless of the findings, well then that would actually give them more confidence in that company and, and enable them to trust the results. <coughs> in terms of the trial design, because um, this is where we came in at the beginning about informing a trial, we found lots of very, very useful information around recruitment. Um, but the antenatal women said that they think, thought they should be recruited in the postnatal period, and the postnatal women said they should be recruited in the antenatal period, so that was a bit of a dilemma. Um, the outcomes of importance were skin dryness, the ability to clean, rashes and skin problems, and the smell. The smell was a huge issue. We had lots of comments like, if water smelt like Johnson's, we'd use it all the time. They really wanted that, that smell. Practicalities, the convenience factor, because we wanted to bring these mothers and babies to the hospital to do assessments on the skin barrier function. 
the number of baths, because the more baths that you actually give babies, the more the skin is going to, to react. And we wanted to see whether they thought the assessments that we wanted to do were in fact acceptable. We also wanted to clarify what confounding variables there were. The oils, which you know, was a real dilemma. Um, the use of wipes, which is becoming more and more popular. Um, even on areas like the face, um, women are using wipes in, in the hospital wards. And the use of cloths, because the cloths can actually influence the, the skin barrier too. So if you've got a more abrasive cloth, you're more likely to have um, a defective skin barrier. We wanted to look at compliance because there would be no, no point in us designing a perfect trial if nobody would actually take part and comply. Um, so would they just be allocated to one group and then as soon as they got home do something different? And what would the follow-up be? Would it, uh, ha for how long? Um, two people did state that they would only comply if they were put in the product group. So just to, to summarise these findings, um, Women and health professionals did seem to have doubts about water's ability to be an effective cleanser. Um, women were probably more explicit and health professionals were more implicit. Health professionals, they do identify this personal and professional conflict when trying to offer women informed advice without having any empirical evidence. And we thought that the qualitative work does suggest that an RCT of bathing versus water is required and it would get a fair degree of support. Our central theme within all this was informed uncertainty. So it wasn't that people weren't informed, they were informed from a, do a lot of different um, avenues, um, but this actually left a lot of confusion. And this was compounded by the fact that health professionals did believe that there was a strong evidence base um, when in actual fact there wasn't. They did draw on different ways of knowing when making decisions. And this study resonated with um, the different ways of knowing, as indicated by Hunter. This was self-knowledge generated from the belief system of the woman or the health professional. Grounded knowledge from the participant's personal experience, whether that was a woman or a health professional, they drew on this. And informed knowledge. And this was from the NICE guidelines and professional papers. So these were really the opinion pieces that they had read. But we did find conflict between these different ways um, of knowing. And there was an uneasiness caused by balancing what they believed to be authoritative knowledge, i.e. the informed knowledge, and what they felt to be intuitively correct. And the ground knowledge was influenced very much by tradition. Um, and this also made a pivotal contribution to decision making and the practice. <coughs> And it, it did seem that the hierarchy of evidence appears to denigrate other forms of knowledge, creating an environment. And this is, this is really important, I think, which promoted using intuition in private. So people were very covert about what they were doing. And I think the best example that I gave you was through this tone the party line, when people were actually, if they thought they were being observed or if they were asked a question for the first time, they would say, yes, water only, that's what I'm doing. But in private, they weren't actually doing that. So instead of challenging um, the status quo and looking for the evidence, people were just doing what they felt were right, um, but doing it in secret. And I actually um, thought this was really interesting too. Um, our findings resonated with some of the work of Polanyi, um, who said that the apprentice unconsciously picks up the rules of the art. And certainly with the health visitors in particular, they did seem to pass down from one, one generation to the next and pick up that art. But to add to that, I thought that what Dean says um, about hidden rules can only be absorbed if the learning is uncritical of the action is so important because these things can't become embedded um, unless we are uncritical. So if we critically look at what we're doing, well then we actually break that cycle and we can make change. As with any studies, it can actually raise a lot of questions um, as well as answers. And some of the questions that I have from this is, how does practice change when there isn't any empirical evidence? Most of the change in terms of baby bathing happened around the early 1980s when there was a number of very influential opinion pieces and presented in professional journals. 
And that was probably at a time um, when midwives were less able to critique the evidence. Um, although you've witnessed from what I've presented today that there are still many health professionals that, that don't appear to be able to um, critique the evidence. And it seems that if something is in print, well, therefore, you know, that is really important. We need to question where does self and grounded knowledge sit within the hierarchy of evidence? Um, because we know as midwives that we do draw on lots of different forms um, of knowing. How do we prevent cherry picking? And this really refers to the oil um, because you know, this, this is quite startling really once you, you learn more about skin that people are actually quite happy to recommend um, to a woman go and get some sunflower oil from your cupboards but don't use any, any products that are actually specifically made for babies. Um, will practice ever change um, or are we so entrenched in our views um, and is tradition so strong that we're not actually going to make any difference? Well, we've used all this information that, that we've received and um, a team of us have worked very hard to actually design um, a randomised control trial of product versus water. Um, it's a randomised assessor blind and control trial comparing an infant skin cleansing product with water in newborn babies. So far, um, we've done the pilot study and we've recruited 100 babies in Liverpool Women's Hospital. Um, Carol Bedwell, who you will hear later, she is actually the midwife who's actually working on this study and has recruited all these babies. We stratified according to the family history of atopic eczema um, because of the reasons I gave you earlier in the presentation. And we looked at a number of outcomes which were influenced with, by the views of the women. We're looking at TUL, which is transepidermal water loss, um, which basically is looking at the evaporation of the water from the skin. Um, and you can see what that looks like here um, on that picture. We're looking at the skin hydration and we're looking at the skin pH. But we're also doing clinical observations and we're following up to see what the women think um, about the group that they're allocated to um, and the treatment they're allocated to. And we've been doing follow-up at 24 hours, which is the baseline assessment, four weeks and eight weeks. And we're also collecting um, data from telephone interviews at 12 weeks. I'm not going to um, present you any findings because we have only just finished the pilot data. Um, but I hope that this presentation has actually just demonstrated to you how valuable qualitative work can be um, in informing randomised controlled trials and um, raise some of the issues and dilemmas that we went through to reach that point, which has taken what seems like a very long time. Um, before I, I just say thank you and invite questions, just want to acknowledge the team, which is Professor Mike Cork, who's um, a dermatologist from Sheffield University, Dr Mark Turner, who's senior lecturer in neonatology at Liverpool University, Dr. Anna Hart, who's a medical statistician at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, I'm getting around the northwest. <laughs> um, Carol Bedwell, who you'll hear from later, and Adiru Sakiri, the research assistant, who you can see in this picture here, bathing her baby. Thank you very much. <laughs>